There we go. Well, first I wanted to uh, thank um, Adrian and, and uh, Thomas for the invitation. I very much appreciate it. I can tell you at Loyal, we um, enjoy the MetaBCD conference every year. So it's, it's a really an honor to be here to tell you more about um, what we're doing at Loyal. Um, so uh, just to, as a way of introduction, we're approaching longevity drug development from, I think, a relatively unique perspective in, in that we're, we're not uh, primarily focusing um, today on humans. So you've seen this slide, and I know that a number of, of uh, people have uh, presented this as really the overarching narrative of why we're interested in tackling aging biology and developing therapeutics that specifically target the underlying biology of aging with the hopes that we will be able to have impacts on multiple disease processes that occur with age rather than a single disease at a time. And certainly that's the underlying uh, hypothesis that got me into this field and, and continues to uh, make me excited about the opportunities we have to impact healthcare. Um, but this is always shown, obviously, in the context of, of human health, where you know the the incidence of major disease increases uh, with chronological age. But this is also true of other um, uh, species as well. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, companion dogs. Um, and so. We see the same sort of trend, of course, occurring in companion dogs as well um, in, in the cases where um, disease incidence and multimorbidity has been tracked um, in dogs through a number of, of uh, great studies, um, uh, predominantly by the Dog Aging Project, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And so the way we're approaching this at Loyal is that we all agree that the priority is to be developing therapeutics that target the underlying uh, biology of aging rather than targeting specific diseases one at a time. But we think the, the strategy behind this is, a, is a unique in terms of the way that we're approaching this problem. So of course, thinking about this in the context of the development of human therapeutics, we know that human lifespans are relatively long, which of course, by definition, necessitates relatively long clinical trials in order to capture enough um, data to prove efficacy, particularly in the context where you wanna demonstrate a lifespan extension. Uh, because of the um, amount of time that it takes, this is, of course, extremely capitally intensive to be able to do studies that are of high complexity and length. And of course, uh, we've spent a, a number of days at this conference talking about the, the regulatory uh, burdens and, and barriers to going after a true anti-aging uh, claim. And, and we can talk maybe in the Q&A about uh, some of the ways that we've been thinking about this from the animal health side as well. And so, of course, our solution is to um, do all of this work in companion animals. And we think that particularly the, the companion dog is the optimal species for doing this comparative aging biology work for a number of reasons. One, you know, traditionally aging, aging research is focused on laboratory animals, uh, rightfully so, um, but living in very controlled and unnatural environments where um, they don't have the opportunity to experience sort of the varied environments, varied diets, and various experience stimuli that, of course, companion dogs living in our homes do experience. Um, dogs also have a very uh, unique and diverse genetic structure and a wide range of phenotypic variations, which I think we can all appreciate when we think about different dog breeds, which allows for powerful comparisons within a species. Um, and, you know, unlike other animals, dogs have access to a sophisticated healthcare system in which they are routinely monitored and treated for diseases um, in a system that's, you know, only slightly behind humans in terms of complexity, um, in, terms, in terms of the healthcare that's delivered. And ultimately, in terms of making a meaningful impact to people, uh, understanding what we're doing in the longevity field, uh, people have a, a very long-standing personal investment in the health and well-being of their dogs. So any sort of um, intervention that improves health span and lifespan in dogs will, will uh, make a meaningful impact to the public at large. All right. So we know from uh, our colleagues at the Dog Aging Project who have done a lot of the excellent pioneering work here in understanding what happens with dog aging, that the companion dog is truly an excellent reflection of human aging in terms of both of uh, the mortality hazard curves um, in the way that um, a dog populations um, uh, uh, survive out to you know, well-defined ages, we know that they have um, common pathophysiological causes of death in many cases, you know, the outstanding 
um, uh, example of, of that not being the case is in, in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but in, in general dogs uh, typically have the same diseases and die of the same sort of things that humans do, um, which is helpful uh, in terms of unraveling the underlying aging pathobiology uh, that's driving um, these diseases. Outside of also diseases that cause mortality, we know that dogs also have age-related changes in various functional domains that um, are similar to what's observed in humans. So in this case, we've asked uh, uh, pet parents to describe the changes they associate with their aging dog. And then we group those into various functional domains. And it, you can just see from these functional domains that a lot of these reflect the domains that we recognize also in human aging. And so um, it gives us a, a lot of power to understand the underlying changes in biology and their functional consequences and how that bridges across um, into other species. I guess most importantly, um, we know at least for one um, aging intervention that it, it has uh, translated extraordinarily well um, between the rodent studies and the human. So in this case, we know that caloric restriction studies in rodents generally are very powerful extending lifespan. Um, and given graded um, caloric restriction, you see um, graded increases in, in uh, mouth lifespan. You know, a, power, a pioneering study that was done by Purina examining a cohort of dogs from birth to death um, under caloric restriction or ad libitum feeding demonstrated a, a remarkably similar percent increase in lifespan with 25% caloric restriction. So really demonstrating that these interventions also work um, well in dogs. So the way that we, we've come to this problem in this, in this field is really the the need that we feel there needs to be on um, more robust translational validation, right? So we have a, a number of studies that are ongoing that have given us a tremendous amount of information about the biology of aging. We know actually much more than most people think we know about the underlying process of aging biology. And that's, you know, manifested in the fact that, you know, my by my count, and I'm sure there are more since I, I did this last count, we have uh, 72 unique compounds that have been demonstrated in mice to extend lifespan. But what I think is very interesting is out of those 72, less than half of them have been replicated. Um, and most of those have been only done at least twice. There's only three drugs that have been done more than uh, six times in a mouse. And so there's an ongoing need for filling the translational gap in longevity science. Um, and that is being able to provide re robust and reproducible findings by both individual independent investigators, but also in a diverse uh, set of organisms. And this is really where the genesis of Loyal is, is as a company uh, built to start to fill in that translational gap and translate all these wonderful discoveries that have been made by the geroscience field into actual therapeutics. And so the core tenet that we um, work under is that companion, we believe that companion animals are the fastest way to an FDA approved longevity therapeutic. And that's really influenced by four main um, uh, components. One, we can do our validation in dogs and ultimately commercialize in dogs. So we're actually not running uh, the risk of having um, a species misalignment or a gap in terms of understanding. We're actually doing all of the work um, in dogs all the way through, which helps us to have great confidence that what we're doing in our early studies will ultimately translate. I think the most important part of this is that we're using lifespan ultimately as an endpoint. We're actually doing a lifespan study to demonstrate that these uh, interventions increase the lifespan of a dog. And I think that's very important, um, powerful tool for, for using uh, companion dogs to demonstrate these effects. And this is only, of course, made uh, manageable by the fact that dogs have a much shorter lifespan than, than humans. So we, on, a, on a relevant time scale, we can actually perform a, a lifespan extension study in dogs. And finally, I think uh, the, the accelerated regulatory timelines have allowed us to really move forward um, product candidates um, in a way that would not be possible, certainly in human medicine. Um, and this is highlighted by the fact that we have now advanced two candidates into clinical development in less than a year uh, from you know, initial um, uh, validation in, in dogs uh, to, to ultimately moving to clinic. Okay, so uh, as that is the basis, I just wanna talk about a couple of different concepts to uh, explain a bit about what we're doing at Loyal. 
Um, the first is uh, this idea of leveraging the great phenotypic diversity that's seen in dogs. Um, so one of the most commonly known uh, phenomena in dogs that is that they have a, a wide range of lifespans by breed, and this is very highly correlated with their adult body mass. So large breed dogs tend to die significantly uh, faster than shorter uh, than small breed dogs, and this is actually a very powerful tool for us to begin to look at the association of aging phenotypes uh, uh, by genetic associations, by understanding the genetics that drive the phenotypic differences in dogs, um, of which there's great pioneering work um, being done by Elaine Ostrander, um, we can begin to associate these aging phenotypes now with these associations for a number of different purposes. One, to understand the mechanisms that drive lifespan diversity in these dogs. Uh, to be able to understand the mechanism of age-related diseases in these dogs. So certainly, uh, as you would anticipate, um, the, uh, the incidence um, and uh, appearance of age-related disease occurs in slightly different fashions in, in dogs of different lifespans. Um, to be able to also understand outlier dog breeds. So there's certainly dog breeds that don't fit the general pattern of falling along the, the body mass by lifespan. Um, uh, association, which I think is really interesting to understand why some dogs are protected from that particular association. And then, of course, importantly, it allows us to have very precise selection of clinical trial populations. We can know from some of the, the again, the great epidemiology work that's been done by the Dog Aging Project to understand um, what we would expect our target population to look like when we start uh, interventions at various ages. So as an example of this, um, we just completed something we, ca we call the Loyal Health Span Study. Um, this was a cross-sectional proof of concept study in uh, dogs of different ages and sizes. You can see essentially it was a comparison of young small dogs and young long, lar large dogs versus old small dogs and old, old large dogs to get at the differences not only of the, the um, shortened lifespan in large dogs, but also to look at the age-related effects on various clinical um, markers like health-related quality of life, um, frailty. Um, and I think importantly for us um, as we're continuing our translational work is to look at the predictive value of various proteomic biomarkers and epigenetic uh, markers as predictors for health span as measured by quality of life and frailty. So I, I, we're very proud that the loyal team was able to uh, uh, bring through 586 dogs over an eight-month period, um, and it really demonstrates. And these are these are companion dogs, so these are people's pet dogs. So it really demonstrates the speed at which you can enroll these target populations when you're working in in the companion dog space. And we've begun to look at the the data that was acquired from this study now that it's closed out. Very exciting, and over the next uh, year or so, we'll we'll be uh, rolling that out for everyone. So this gets to one of the core focuses of Loyal, which is building the translational aging assessment tools. One of the things that we spend a lot of our time doing is both on the preclinical side and on the translational and clinical development side is building the tools that allow us to accurately access um, the uh, trajectory of aging in these, um, in these companion dogs. And this includes things like functional models in our preclinical space to be able to provide accurate um, predictions. Um, it also uh, includes uh, protein and nucleic acid biomarkers, allows us to do early target validation. And then on the clinical and translational development side, building the frailty and multimorbidity assessment tools, activity, sleep quality, quality of life assessments, and of course, quantitative biomarkers of therapeutic efficacy, which will be very important for us as we're doing these multi-year lifespan studies. So of course, we've heard a lot about epigenetic clocks and, and the changes in epigenetic, um, uh, the epigenome with age um, in the context of humans uh, over the last several days. And uh, a really uh, pioneering paper by uh, um, uh, Trey Eidecker's lab at UCSD demonstrated that you could also develop an epigenetic clock for dogs, and in this case, use it in a way that could uh, syntetically map to the human epigenome. So you could actually build an accurate correlation of, of uh, human and dog aging across um, the, uh, the developmental landmarks of, of each species, which has been in incredibly powerful. And so we have actually exclusively licensed this technology for use in dogs, um, and our computational biology team is working um, uh, really hard at um, increasing 
um, our knowledge of in use of these epigenetic clocks by generating next generation epigenetic uh, clock algorithms um, to be able to predict biological age in these dogs. And we've uh, announced that we've partnered with the Morris Animal Foundation to explore um, detecting cancer in their golden retriever cohort using these methylation assays. Ultimately, we wanna apply these methylation assays to be able to detect biological age. And so over the next uh, several months, we'll be releasing uh, into the public free canine test kits that will be used as part of a citizen science experiment, what we're calling the, the loyal pack um, that will start to collect um, a large amount of epigenome data um, from companion dogs in the field. Okay, so the next part uh, in terms of our key focus is the concept of the opposite of caloric restriction, which is of course caloric excess. Um, yesterday, may have, many of you may have not known, in fact, I didn't know that um, it was pet obesity day. And the sad fact is that uh, the majority of pet dogs and cats in the United States are overweight uh, or obese. Um, and that has functional consequences on lifespan, as you may expect. This translates very well to our understanding um, from human biology as well. A very nice study by Salt et al. demonstrated that overweight dogs, uh, either male or female, um, uh, died at significantly uh, younger ages compared to, um, uh, to normal weight dogs. So th this is also demonstrating that um, uh, excessive nutrition drives early uh, mortality in dogs as well. And we um, are really interested in the association, particularly of insulin sensitivity and its decline. It's known that insulin sensitivity declines in humans, and it's been well described as being both in obesity and an age-related um, uh, disease phenotype. Um, but it's also been shown in dogs, particularly, again, in that Perina study, that caloric restriction in dogs preserves insulin sensitivity late in life. So we're actually very interested in understanding the consequences of, of insulin sensitivity um, with age in dogs. And this gets us to really sort of the core proximal cause of insulin um, resistance um, around the dysregulation of adipose tissue. So this is, of course, most um, clearly described in the context of obesity, where you get adipose tissue dysfunction, which leads into ectopic spillover of lipids into to skeletal muscle and liver as a key component of insulin resistance. But it isn't just about obesity. We think this is actually a key player um, in age-related metabolic decline as well. And I just highlight one study here that um, did um, removal of, of visceral fat from non-obese dogs um, a very small amount of visceral fat removal resulted in a, a profound increase in insulin sensitivity in these aged non-obese dogs. So finally, this gets us to the second core focus of, of loyal, which I think fits very nicely with the core focus of, of metabesity in that we are uh, profoundly interested in um, looking into metabolic dysfunction and companion dog aging. Um, and really exploring the link between obesity-induced um, metabolic dysfunction and how that relates to the mechanism of aging-induced metabolic function, dysfunction. And so just highlighting two aspects that we know are conserved, again, between dogs and humans. Dogs have a significant redistribution of adipose from subcutaneous to visceral fat, the same as humans do with age. Um, that was described uh, earlier last year. And um, dogs also have an age-related increase in, in lipid dysregulation as measured by triglyceride levels. So all of these aspects are, are the core uh, focus of the, of the company in terms of the therapeutic strategies that we're developing um, and demonstrating the, the importance of maintaining metabolic health with age. Okay, so with that, um, just a brief introduction to the loyal team. We have a really passionate and um, uh, experienced team working on all of these problems from both the biology in it and the computational biology end, um, as well as from the clinical and operation side as well. So uh, happy to discuss more. About